welcome. My name is Janati Stolirov II. I'm the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. This is a supplementary session for our virtual enlightenment salon of November 14th, 2021 with our friends from Fair Vote Washington. We will delve into some technical details of ranked choice voting with multiple winners. And we have a presentation that Stony Bird of Fair Vote Washington will walk us through regarding how this process works. So thank you, Janati. This is one of my favorite stories about why you don't want winner take all elections and why you do want ranked choice voting elections. This is what happened in British elections in the 80s during the Maggie Thatcher years. Her party, the Tories would get 40% of the vote, roughly speaking, but get 60% of the seats in parliament. The Labour Party would get 30% of the vote, roughly speaking, and 40% of the seats in parliament. And the Liberal Party would get roughly the same number of votes from the electorate as the Labour Party, but only get a handful of places in parliament. What was happening? is that the Liberal Party was always coming in second, either to the Tories or to Labour. And that meant that since it was winner take all elections and one representative per district, they just didn't ever get anybody uh, seated in Parliament. This is an example of more or less the same thing from Washington State, an actual election that occurred in 2016 when we were electing the state treasurer. There were two Republican candidates who split a vote. This is in the primary, split a vote of 48%, and three Democratic candidates who split a vote of 52%. So the voters preferred Democrats, but because of the vote splitting, it was the two Republicans who went through to the uh, general election. And you can find other examples that turned it around and meant that the Republicans were not adequately represented. This is just another example of the same thing, which we won't go into. One of the most important concepts to understand in election methodry is the concept of wasted votes. And when political scientists talk about wasted votes, what they mean is votes that don't result in representation. So here we have a one candidate, candidate A, who got 60% of the vote, and another candidate, candidate B, who got 40%. It's pretty easy to see that the 40% who voted for candidate B got no representation as a result of having voted. So their votes were in that very strict mechanical sense wasted. But if you look at the votes for candidate A, all that candidate needed in the way of votes was 40% plus one in order to beat candidate B. But that candidate A got 20% more than the candidate needed in order to be elected. And that extra 20% produces as little representation as the 40% for candidate B. So what you have is 60%, 40% plus 20% of the votes producing no representation in this election. And so a majority of the votes. And what you find is that the number of wasted votes in any winner take all election involving two candidates is equal to the number of votes for the winning candidate every time, just as a mathematical certainty. And it's worse if there are more than two candidates. And it's these wasted votes that produce the spoiler problem and the gerrymandering problem. But we'll get into that. Most of the rest of this is going to be about proportional ranked choice voting. And one of the key points about it is that the threshold for election is not a majority as it is for single winner ranked choice voting, but 
a threshold calculated using this formula. You take the total votes and divide it by one more than the number of positions being elected and add one to that. So for example, if there were 100 votes in an election and you were electing three people, you divide 100 by four and get 25 and then add one and 26, get 26, and 26 would be the threshold for election. Someone would have to get 26 votes in order to be elected. If the number of positions were four, you divide the 100 votes by five and get 20 and add one, and then the threshold would be 21. We saw this a little bit when Lisa was talking about picking the number of positions to be elected from a given district so that you were satisfied that the threshold was neither too large nor too small. I sort of agree with her that somewhere in the region of five or six or seven, which would mean if you were electing five, it would be one sixth. If you were electing six, it would be one seventh. If you were electing seven, it would be one eighth of the turnout that sort of region is probably where you want to end up. And another crucial concept for proportional ranked choice voting is what you do with surplus votes. We saw the surplus votes in the example before. With the owl, yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And suppose a candidate gets 60 votes, but the threshold was 50. So the candidate has 10 surplus votes, you use the little formula on the right to calculate what fraction of, of votes to transfer to this next choice on the ballot. So it's the surplus votes over the total votes. In this case, it would be 10 over 60. Which of those 60 would go over? Would it be the, the last 10 that was voted? Every one of the 60 ballots would get a sixth of a vote transferred to the next choice on the ballot. Every one. Ah, okay. I get it. Yeah, because because you don't know which 10 ballots produce the surplus. It, that all 60 ballots contributed to the surplus. As Lisa mentioned in the last presentation, uh, think of it as having a dollar bill to spend on candidates. Yeah. And so because this candidate has extra, you're getting back some change on this candidate to spend on your next choice. You're getting right. back one sixth of your dollar to then use on your second and third choices. So here's a little flow diagram about how you run the rounds of counting in a proportional ranked choice voting election. And you start in the parallelogram on the left, where citizens fill out their ballots. And then right where the arrow leads to the is anyone winning box, you calculate the threshold. Because at that point, you know how many voters there are, and you know how many positions need to be filled. And you get whatever that figure is. OK. Then you get to the box in the middle. And if someone has reached the threshold, they become a winner. You go all, all the way over to the right. And two things might happen. If they have surplus votes, you go through the fractionalization that I just described. Then you retabulate. If someone now is over the finish line, the threshold, you go around that loop again. But if no one is over the threshold at that point, the person in last place is eliminated, just as they were in the first demo that Kit described. And then their votes, all of their votes, not fractionalized, but their entire votes go to the next choice on their ballot. And then you do another tally to see if anybody's above the threshold. And keep going around one or the other of these two circuits until all the positions are filled. And something to remember about all ranked choice tabulations is that technically you actually count every single ballot every time you do the tabulation. 
right. some people use some phraseology like your votes are transferred or whatever. But all it really means is you count all the ballots for the candidate that you ranked highest who has not yet been eliminated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when Minneapolis was considering whether to adopt ranked choice voting, Minnesota Public Radio explained how you do these calculations and they called it instant runoff voting with fractions, just to produce yet another term. And since the video goes past at lightning speed, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a primer on it. So they are electing, first of all, you, you figure out the threshold. In this election, there are 36 voters and three positions to fill. So you see the calculation of the threshold down at the bottom of the slide there. There are 36 divided by three plus one, four, produces nine, and then you add one more and you get the threshold of 10. 36 comes from the 36 voters. And right. Then we get, where's the four? Remember the formula was total votes over one more than the number of positions to be filled. Oh, one more than, okay, okay, okay. Right. Yeah. And that makes nine and then you add one to that and that makes 10. So this is gonna be done with stickies. And you can see that the threshold for election there, the red line. And here they are working the fractions. You can see that the purple candidate crossed the red line, got two more votes than was needed. So the, the purple candidate has two surplus votes and you can see the calculation of the fraction to be transferred down at the bottom to divided by 12, that's the total number of votes that uh, purple got, right? So, and then you can see the guy with his scissors snipping off one sixth of the ballot to be passed on to other candidates. A really important concept is the concept of exhausted ballots. And that can mean either a ballot which in some later round of counting wants to vote for a candidate who has dropped out or been eliminated, a ballot can be exhausted in that sense, or it means that the voter just didn't rank very many candidates and there's no candidate left on the ballot to which to assign the ballot. In either case, that would be an exhausted ballot. How did they figure out the one sixth? So purple had 12 votes total and two surplus votes. Sweet. So the number of that the fractional vote to be transferred to each of the 12 is two twelfths, one sixth. Ah. Okay. That extra two votes, that goes to all of the other candidates? You can see that the fellow with the scissors has picked mm -hmm. up the first ballot to the left and is snipping off one sixth. And you'll find various colors underneath the purple. And whatever they are, get that one sixth of a vote. Okay. Then they'll pick up the second purple ballot going from left to right and snip off a sixth. And whatever that ballot says is what will happen. Let's put ourselves on mute. Watch the video right now. It's two minutes, 42 seconds. And then we can ask the questions about that video. I'm doing that was actually easier to understand. You could see him, the guy moving those the six pieces around and that was made it easier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now that we have watched this video and we encourage our audience to watch it by following the link that was previously provided, does anybody from the US Transhumanist Party have any questions about the technical mechanics of the allocation? I don't see any questions, which means that the video explained it quite clearly. Good. I have a few more slides if you want to see those. Yes, sure. we can proceed with the additional slides. The first person to think of proportional ranked choice voting was this Hare fellow in 1857. And John Stuart Mill, a British political philosopher, was a fan of, as well. Proportional representation as such began not in the 
ranked choice voting form, but in as a party list kind of thing was first was adopted in many European countries around the turn of the 20th century, Belgium being the first. And one of the interesting facets of that process was that at the same time they were moving to party list for proportional representation, they were moving towards universal manhood suffrage and also votes for women. And the people who had had the vote, namely rich men, realized that with universal suffrage, they would be left out in the cold unless there was some kind of proportionality. And so they voted for that as well. And this is just data about how prevalent all the various voting methods are around the world. This is fairly key for the United States. This is what the US Constitution says about elections of senators and congressional representatives. It's up to each state in the first instance to decide how congressional representatives are elected, unless Congress intervenes. Well, Congress did intervene in 1967, and I'll get into that in a moment. But before then, each state was deciding how its congressional delegation would be elected. And that by and large, some states chose to elect them from districts. Other states chose to elect them statewide. And some states had a combination of those two things. By the 60s, only Illinois, I believe, was still using statewide elections to elect its congressional delegation. And what was also happening in the 60s is the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And some people in Congress were afraid that the Southern states might go back to at-large elections, statewide elections, so that the white majority would get all the seats in, let's say, Alabama and thwart the aims of the Voting Rights Act. So Congress passed this law, which it's, it's allowed to do under the Constitution, saying that from now on, all congressional representatives in the United States will be elected from single member districts. If we want to get proportional ranked choice voting for elections to Congress, this law would have to be repealed but a state could still adopt single winner ranked choice voting for its congressional delegation, which wouldn't have all the benefits that you wanna get. It would get rid of the spoiler effect, but not gerrymandering, but it would be a step. But to get proportional ranked choice voting, we'd have to have this law repealed. In talking to people, I've often heard the opinion that there would have to be a constitutional amendment, but that's not true. The Constitution well, the, allows the states to do that. The Supreme Court kind of gutted the Voting Rights Act. I think the law that states have to get be approved by the uh, federal government before they make changes, I think yep. that got repealed. Yep. Well, that that's the famous thing that happened. This law has rather drastic effects on elections to Congress, but it's not very famous. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and it's now uh, 50 years old. Anyway, this is about the Washington state. There was a Progressive Change Institute poll in 2016 of likely voters across the political spectrum, and they came up with a list of 50 issues that voters across the political spectrum all supported by as much as 80%, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, 80%, and on which Congress is sitting on its hands. <laughs> well, yeah, and, obstructionism. You know, uh, somebody mentioned, I think, in the chat about how it might be a bad thing if there was, you know, more political parties and, and if it was a little more, uh, you know, if the power was spread out a little bit, but, you know, I, I think what comes to my mind is, well, you know, then they wouldn't be able to get together and just obstruct because right. I mean, that's, that's a, what they seem to do. I mean, there's one party that that's pretty much all they do. 
Well, mm -hmm. see, the point about these 50 issues is that the voters, Democrats, independents, Republicans, all support them. In Congress, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are working to get them passed. It's both part, both major parties that are obstructing things. And despite all the brouhaha, those two parties in Congress are united in, oh, there we go, are united in two things. <laughs> preserving the system of gerrymandering and preserving the system of campaign bribery. Because of those two things, they don't have to pay attention to the voters. And systematically, they don't. I mean, you yeah. see, 80% of the voters want the government to negotiate drug prices. 80% of the voters across the political spectrum. Almost 80% want fair trade instead of free trade. Almost 80% want Congress to end gerrymandering. And on and on and on and on down this list of about 50 different things, which they are not attending to, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans. Right. If they get together and they can, one issue, if they get, that's why they love them wedge issues. If they can get one issue that, like abortion, you know, somebody that's pro pro abortion, but you know, is also pro guns and pro, you know what I'm saying? But if they get them on that one issue, it doesn't matter what they do. Now they got them. Right. You know, and then and the with public, gerrymandering, it doesn't matter what they do. They'll get elected anyway. Right. Yes. That's, that's the whole point about the culture war, that's, you know, if they can get them on the culture war to where they just hate the other side, then it doesn't matter what the issues are. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, um, indeed. And we're trying to overcome this polarization that has definitely been engendered by the culture war, but also by the two-party system because people feel the pressure to coalesce into these two monolithic blocks that espouse ideas that are not logically related to one another. They just happen to be the outcome of coalitions forming within the two blocks. Now, Celeste has a question about implementation of ranked choice voting. So uh, Celeste, please proceed. Hi, yes. Yeah, so this is my question about how to implement this. So I see we have been successful in the U.S. in a number of locations, numerous locations. And I see you guys are working on this for Washington State. And it sounds like you also have some national support that you're working on as well. And so I do, I want to hear about how to implement this. This needs to be more widespread throughout the U.S. How can we build up the implementation of these more fair voting systems? Uh, get in touch with your local fair vote group. There are, if not fair vote, there's some group in your state that's working on this. I'm, I'm almost certain. Where are you based, yeah. Celeste? I'm actually in San Francisco, so I'm so lucky. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. But you've got lots of stuff. <laughs> we don't necessarily have that, like I was mentioning on our, when we go to vote for the president, that right. even in San Francisco where I live and I vote, that does not apply to the presidential vote for the president or vice president. I haven't seen it in the California vote for the state options as well. Um, I did notice it on the ballot. There were a couple things where you had to choose a second or third maybe mm -hmm. option. I did notice that on the, the voting, but I think it's mostly locally based for the city and county of San Francisco. Right. San Francisco and Oakland both use ranked choice voting and five other cities uh, voted to start using ranked choice voting. So I don't know if they've started yet. What, what's the organization that's working for that kit, do you know, or Chris? It's in, it's, in the, it's in the chat. I put it in the chat, fairvoteca.org. Okay. And because, because the voting laws are different in every state, you know, it's... Um, yeah, there's a brand new group, calrcv.org, that has just kicked up um, trying to really ramp up across the whole state, I believe. Great. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Yes. Yeah, I noticed we got one in Illinois. 
I got signed up with them guys. You can have mm -hmm. a good one in Illinois. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, I, we post one of their staff. <laughs> <laughs> our, our communications director from Illinois. And what is it about the national voting system when we're talking about electoral voting? There was it something in the Constitution that is designating it's strictly only the states, so we can't have any sort of national option for the ranked choice voting? No, no. Congress, Congress could decide that we're going to have ranked choice voting for elections to Congress. They could decide that. Or they could re repeal the law that says you have to have uh, single member districts. I think so. And then the states could decide. The president, presidential election, and the election. I am. Oh, 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 I'm presidential sorry. Presidential yeah. elections, the congressional elections are extremely important, absolutely, 100%. But Kit is right. I was thinking about for our electoral vote for the presidential elections. Was so each state question. determines how they want to do the elections to determine their electoral votes. So it, would, right. it is necessary to get the states to make the change individually. So two yes. states do things a little differently. Maine and Nevada mm. uh, split their electoral votes uh, proportionally. Uh, if Maine does it by districts, I'm not sure how Nevada does it. Nebraska. Ne oh, thank you, Nebraska. Yes, Maine, yes Nebraska. Maine does have three electoral votes, or at least they, they allocate one to one district, another to the other district, and then one at large, I believe is how they've done that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is somewhat proportional to population you know, in the, across their state, but certainly not ranked in any way. All right. Thank you for that discussion. And it seems that our members who want to get involved in advocacy of ranked choice voting have quite a few options among the state chapters of fair vote. Also, different states have different nuances about where and how they implement ranked choice voting if they do, and as we stated in the main virtual enlightenment salon, we hope that those options expand over the coming years. Also, thank you once again to Stony for our technical presentation that was provided that helped explain the mechanics of proportional ranked choice voting. Now, I have one question, and that is in regard to communicating those mechanics to the general public. And certainly mm. the video that you provided attempted to use uh, very helpful illustrations with sticky notes and cutting up the individual votes into fractions that were visually reallocated. Do you think that in itself has the potential to reach large numbers of people uh, I know with regard to single winner rank choice voting, the concept is fairly simple to communicate in words. Is there a similar way if you are in a public place, you don't have access to a whiteboard or sticky notes or a mobile phone, what can you say to an individual if you're engaged in a political discussion and you want to advocate proportional ranked choice voting with multiple winners that would enable that person to readily grasp how that approach operates? Well, I learned <laughs> not to try to explain the math to someone <laughs> without any, any uh, visual aids. And the thing is, if you look at it from the voter's perspective, and I think this is the most important thing when you're talking to people about it is the voter's perspective. The voter needs to know how to fill out the ballot and turn it in. And that's it. And it's the auditor's job, the election official's job to do the tabulating, to uh, transfer votes, to come up with a winner. And this process is uh, can be very transparent. You can look up the different rounds that can be published. And if someone is interested in the math, 
then it, it should take some time because um, it can be confusing. And with a uh, single winner, I say if uh, with single winner, I say rank choice voting is a simple change to the way we vote. Um, you can rank if you're more than two candidates, you can rank your choices, first choice, second choice, third choice. If your first choice doesn't have a chance to win, your vote goes to your next choice, period. Uh, with proportional representation, you can say we're voting for these candidates in a pool and we're going to use a ranked choice ball ballot and get the three top candidates, period. That's, that's what I would do. And then if someone is interested in the math, and we all are because here we are, we think it's fascinating and awesome. But a lot of people really don't want to look under the hood of the car. They they don't care how the carburetor works. Now, what about <laughs> what about introducing it to the general populace? Uh, let's say like McDonald's, they, they always have the, the monopoly game. What if the, when people are ordering at the screens, they can do a quick, oh, um, vote for your favorite dessert or something mm -hmm. and slowly start introducing it to people uh, like restaurants, you know, like, like that. Is there any way that you can push for that to maybe get McDonald's to start using that in voting for their favorite dessert or their favorite burger or whatever? That's a great idea. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. And, so we... and uh, what I what I learned, what I heard about uh, the campaign to adopt ranked choice voting in Maine was that in before one of those uh, initiatives, there was a beer ranking event in some pub in Maine every night for a year, organized by the volunteers. Wow, see that? Yeah, that is a good idea then. And so, so one of the things that we were doing here in Bellingham and around Washington State before COVID struck was holding ranking events in a brewery or a chocolate place. We went to a distillery once, you know, <laughs> and any place that has stuff that people would like to rank. That takes that some persistence to keep doing that for a year, but I can see oh. the benefit in introducing people to how it operates. And and you've got to talk to people one by one to a great extent. Not, you don't have to spend much time, but you, it's got to be sort of face-to-face, one-to-one, and lots of it. And yes. once people use it once, like you said, you know, if it was, if it was at McDonald's, that would be awesome. But once people use it once, it's it's pretty easy to grasp the voting they part. get it yeah as a technologist i would suggest a nice ad that goes onto all the social media and to google just kind of online that has some fun like you guys were explaining the chocolate rankings or something like mm -hmm. that to mm -hmm. explain the fairness of the voting system to you know appeal to the mass right there is um there have been some when we get the timing right and put up an election and it, it's fun yeah. Yes, indeed. And I would echo Stoney's comment about one to one communication. I think that often has the greatest probability of success because one reaches out directly to the individual with whom one is speaking and gets to understand mm -hmm. that individual's worldview, interests, any reservations that person might have about the idea that one is trying to communicate and address those reservations directly. Of course, the drawback of this approach is that it is extremely time and effort intensive. And so one person can't do it all in terms of spreading yeah. an idea. Yeah. And this approach requires a distributed <clears throat> grassroots network of activists in multiple jurisdictions, locations, among multiple groups within the larger society so that uh, people from all over the country can be reached. So that is definitely a promising approach, but we need a, a lot of people to partake in it. So the, the, in, in Fair Vote Washington, what do you think, Kit, uh, Kit and Chris, are there maybe 
20 or 30 sort of active leads, something like that. Yeah, I'd say that's reasonable in terms of the... Some, something like that. So, so Janati, that means people who are spending some significant amount of time as volunteers talking about ranked choice voting, very often tabling so that it's, it's a one-to-one -one conversation across the table or in front of the table. And through that process over the last several years, we've got a roughly... I think it's around 9,000 people who have signed up as supportive of ranked choice voting. And they are not out tabling, but they are, I've, I'm convinced of this, <laughs> talking to their friends and, and explaining that there is a way around the bind that we're in. And, and they will also be people who at least potentially, when, when we get to running an initiative, a statewide initiative, uh, would go out and gather signatures. And, but that, you know, you, you, it takes time and effort to build up a body of people like that. Mm -hmm. and, yes, getting- But, but that's, that's what it takes. Getting that- momentum going, especially initially, I think is the most challenging step, uh, particularly for a younger organization to carry out. But I agree, once it is carried out, it definitely brings a lot of payoff in terms of then how quickly the message can spread. And that's encouragement for the U.S. Transhumanist Party and other allied organizations within our movement, because if we want to keep spreading our ideas, we need to be persistent. We need to communicate with a lot of people. We need to listen to them as well mm -hmm. and respond to the feedback that they give us. But if we can convince enough people of the merits of our ideas, then they will carry them forward and communicate with their circles, which sometimes would have been difficult for us to reach directly. So thank you very much to everyone for your comments. I'm going to ask one last time if any of the US Transhumanist Party representatives have any questions for Fair Vote Washington. Are you in touch with the other Fair Votes of the other states? Because I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. the one in Illinois is called Fair Vote Illinois. Do you guys like coordinate? stuff we're, we're now together and the the local the statewide fair vote groups are are financially and legally separate from national fair vote but we definitely communicate um we have national calls national um webinars uh, panels etc yeah i'm thinking you know cool just coordinating on some votes you know, and having events where there's votes, even if the votes aren't important, you know, it would give it an opportunity for more people to just see mm -hmm. the process and, and, you know, happening, I think would like, like Art's idea of McDonald's, that would go a long way. You know, and I'm not surprised about the beer story, you know, <laughs> I, you know I, I'm, I could see where that could have had a, an effect, you know, because once you see it in working, you understand that, yeah, this is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah we went to one brewery, which, which uh, at the same night they had a trivia night. And so everybody who was there was sort of used to the idea of paying attention to something that was going on for the whole group. And, and we had them rank, rank the beers in that, in that place. And then there was a little ex explanation of uh, how the ranking worked. But every, you know, you were talking to people, real physical people right there about things they cared about, and that works. Yeah, and working at scale, Washington State University, which is, I don't know what the student, student body is, but it's a lot, uh, just started using ranked choice voting for their student elections. Ah. Yes, and I think it's worthwhile to note that not only political bodies are able to use this technique, the more institutions use it, 
the likelier it is that people will be aware of it. People will be aware of the benefits and the salutary incentive effects. And the U.S. Transhumanist Party is just one example of an organization that uses ranked choice voting. We call it ranked preference voting internally. And we are not a government body. A political party is a private entity. So we do not have the same restrictions on us that local or state election officials would have. We can implement these innovations a lot more rapidly. But when we do that, we have about 3,700 members right now, and they are educated as to how this approach works. And they would be more inclined, I think, to advocate its application for uh, official elections at the local, state, or federal level. So, you know, if the if our platform, the USTP platform, is any example of what you know ranked choice voting can do, then I think it's been a success. Because I love our platform, and you know, if it was made through ranked choice voting, then I think it's a good idea. You know? Here, here. Yes. I'm, I'm not. I'm just curious, Gennady. Was the whole thing? Even in the very, very beginning, was it, did you guys have ranked choice voting way back when it was first, first starting? Yes. So yeah. whenever there were more than two options proposed, so the default two options are either accept somebody's idea of the wording for a platform section or reject it and not have any wording. But the moment somebody included alternative wording, some variation on that wording, uh, or some proposal that differs significantly from the original, then we do a uh, rank ordering and we use rank choice voting, the instant runoff process, uh, as many rounds as we need to get to the winning result. And always when we have our members proposing platform sections, each member has the option to propose something slightly different for that subject matter. And as a result, not on all questions, but on many of the questions, we ended up needing to ask our members to rank order the options. Yeah, I think it's worked out really well. I mean, I, I, it, it has made a very enlightened platform. So it works. Yes, indeed. Well, and thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, Stoney and Kit and Chris, and thank you to Lisa as well. We appreciate your insights. We appreciate your time today, and I think our audience is going to enjoy this supplementary session as well. And to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in. And until next time, live long and prosper. <laughs>